2 Corinthians chapter 11, if you will, in the honor of reading God's Word, stand, if you're able. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to read what we went over this morning, plus one more verse. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. You guys can have a seat. Thank you. Praise God for the reading of his word. Verse 4 is where we're going to be tonight. Verse 4, 2 Corinthians. This is about discernment. We see another Jesus here. We see another spirit here. And we see another gospel here. What is heresy? Heresy are damnable things that we might believe about who God is or how he saves. Do you know the truth? Do you know the falsehood from the truth? Or do you know the truth from the almost truth? Remember, Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, discernment is not knowing the truth from the lie. It's knowing the truth from the almost truth. Do you know the word so well that you know the truth over the falsehood and over the almost truth? How much heresy is too much heresy? Think about this. How many bugs in your peanut butter are too many bugs? Well, the FDA, our dear trusted FDA, they say that they allow 30 insect fragments for every 100 grams of peanut butter. Is that too much for you? If grandma brought brownies, Gentry's been waiting on this analogy. If grandma brought brownies to Thanksgiving and she said, I only put a teaspoonful of cow manure in there, how many of those would you eat? Yet we do that with Christianity. We put a little bit of cow manure in, a little bit of falsehood. We put a little bit of lie in with our truth, and people gobble them down. They're eating the brownies down. We've got Christian knickknacks. We've got Christian t-shirts, Christian music, Christian beach towels. We've got Christian cookies. We've got Christian everything. But are those things really even Christian? We'll buy everything and anything that labels itself Christian, but Christian doctrine divides, doesn't it? Having sound doctrine divides. Jesus promised that, that it would divide father from son and mother from daughter. He said Christian doctrine divides. Amen. Guess what? Christian doctrine saves. We are saved Amen. because we know the true truth, the real truth thing who is christ if we've got the wrong christ we don't have salvation what is the gospel the wrong gospel means we're not saved at all that is christian doctrine the answers to those questions are the difference between heaven and hell eternal life and eternal death remember we are joined to christ that's what we talked about this morning we're joined to christ we have been given his word. Pastor Dave reminds us always to be what? To be Bereans. To study the word. To make sure the things that we're hearing, the things that we're being taught are the truth. We want to be Bereans. Remember Spurgeon saying it's not just knowing the difference in right and wrong, but the difference in right and almost right. It's easy to see the difference in a brownie and a cow patty, right? Right? But to tell the difference when the brownies are tainted, 
just a little bit, one teaspoonful of manure. That's when discernment comes into play. Another Jesus. How much heresy when it comes to Jesus is too much heresy? We're going to read this verse again in just a sec. But remember the difference in a primary and a secondary doctrine. Primary doctrines are the difference in heaven and hell. You can boil them down to who is God and what is the gospel. Who is Jesus and how are we saved? Does it have to do with the doctrines of God and who God is? And does it have to do with salvation and the doctrine of salvation? That's called soteriology. So if we get those things wrong, if we get who God is wrong, and if we get how we're saved wrong, then that's the difference in heaven and hell. A secondary doctrine might be the mode of baptism. We've got Presbyterian brothers that sprinkle babies, but we know they're still our brothers. Eschatology, the study of end times. We've got people who are premillennial, amillennial, postmillennial. Those differences don't mean we're still not brothers in Christ. We can have differences of opinion on things about end times and still be brothers. Ecclesiology, the study of the church. How we do church. Some churches believe in the elder-led. Some have deacon-led. Some have congregation-led. But as long as we're believing that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. That last alone, that Christ alone, that's where we're going to start at today. Let's read the verse again. Verse 4, chapter 11, 2 Corinthians. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye received another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So, another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. That's how the King James puts it. If you have another version you're looking at, it, it may say another Jesus, a different spirit or a different gospel those are different words but essentially they mean the same thing another the one attached to jesus is the greek word allos it just means another as it says in the english it's pretty plain heteros y'all probably heard that word you know a heterogeneous mixture would be like macaroni and cheese. You've got macaroni and you've got cheese in there. They're two different things. They stay separated, but they're mixed together. It's different. They can never become the same thing. The macaroni never becomes cheese. The cheese never becomes macaroni, but they're mixed in there. And that's what you want to think about when we think of a different spirit and a different gospel. They're never going to be the true thing. They're never going to be the same thing. They can never be mixed together successfully. But these are synonymous. The allos attached to Jesus and the heteros attached to spirit and gospel. They really mean the same thing. They're synonymous. Another, a different, not the same is what Paul is emphasizing here. Another Jesus whom we have not preached. Let's look at that another Jesus. There is one Christ, but who is he? Do we know who he is? The Jesus of Scripture is truly God, and he's truly man. We know that from the totality of Scripture, that he is truly God, he is truly man. The Jesus of Scripture is the second member of the triune God, the second member of the Trinity. The Jesus of Scripture has eternally existed. The Jesus of Scripture, as we just sang about in Silent Night, was born of a virgin. The Jesus of Scripture lived a sinless life. The Jesus of Scripture really died. He really was buried. He really was raised up from the dead. The real Jesus does not tolerate sin. He hates sin. He hates it so much. But he loves us so much that he took the wrath of the Father upon himself. The Jesus of Scripture will come again to judge the living and the dead. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, 
which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So where it says, let's start at the very end of that. It says, ye might bear with him in the King James. The New American Standard says, you bear this beautifully. The ESV, which I think is probably the more accurate reading of those three, it says you put up with it readily enough. And that's describing the Corinthians very well. He's saying, Corinthians, these false brothers have come in, <coughs> and he's saying, they're preaching to you another Jesus. Uh, they've got another spirit, and they're telling you about another gospel. And you're putting up with it. Stop putting up with it. Stop it, Corinth. You're putting up with bad doctrine just to get along. You have been deceived. So in the ESV where it says you put up with it readily enough, that's probably the more accurate. Corinth, these false brothers, they've been preaching another Christ. You fall in hook, line, and sinker. What do Mormons call themselves these days? They call themselves just another denomination of Christianity. They're not. They're a cult. They call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Pretty soon they're just going to drop that Latter-day Saints off there and just say, well, we're the Church of Jesus Christ. No, born-again believers are the Church of Jesus Christ, not of Latter-day Saints. They want to normalize their cult. Mormons have a different Jesus. They say Jesus is the brother of Satan. That's not in Scripture. They say that God was once a man, just like us, and he has progressed to becoming God. And that means that all of us can progress to becoming God. That's not in Scripture. Let's be Bereans. Let's look at the Word and see what the Word says. <coughs> They think that we're going to one day become gods. No. At one time, do you know who the largest group of converts to Mormonism was? Southern Baptists. At one time. I don't know if that's still the case. Why? Because those Southern Baptists were not born again. You are not deceived into a false Jesus if you have the true spirit. If you are results of the true gospel, you will not fall for a false Jesus. They were victims of easy believism. What? Easy in, easy out. In the front door with all the pomp, all the circumstance, but quietly pushed out the back door, inflating numbers, inflating numbers for decades in our denomination, baptizing people who didn't even know who Jesus was. You may know political pundit Glenn Beck. He is a Mormon. Um, he says some things we would probably agree with on the political side. But he is lost as a goose. And what's he do? He buddies up with Christian pastors. He appears in their churches for speaking engagements. He partners up with them. He holds hands with them. Guess what? We can't hold hands with Glenn Beck. He is... Believing in another Jesus. Amen. Yes, just because they're political allies, that's great. Well, Glenn Beck, if he does not repent and believe in the true Jesus, he will go to hell calling himself a brother to these Christians who were too afraid of political expediency to correct him. They wanted him to be their political ally, so they'll let him go to hell. It's just one example. Jehovah's Witnesses. They deny that Jesus is God. Muslims deny that Jesus is God. There's a movement today called Chrislam. Have y'all ever heard of Chrislam? It's a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Islam mixed together. Well, guess what? I guess their Jesus is 50% God, since they don't believe him to be God. It's a mixing and a mingling. It's called syncretism. Uh, this weekend, I've been watching this documentary on the Beatles. And George Harrison was their guitar player, and he was big into these Eastern religions, big into Hare Krishnas. Well, that's syncretism. It's a mixture. They've got a Jesus, but he's not the Jesus of the Bible. George Harrison, if he didn't repent before he died, he went straight to hell being a devout Hare Krishna. We can't allow a mixture of false 
and true. We can't have a teaspoonful of their falseness in our truth. It taints the whole batch. Amen. We want to remember that. <clears throat> Jews deny Jesus as God. The modalist denies the triuneness of God. Modern liberal so-called Christianity, liberal Christianity is not Christianity at all, but it's a totally different religion. They deny the exclusivity of Christ. That you can just, as long as you're sincere about whatever you believe, he'll let you in, right? That's what they believe. It's, it's a lie. They deny who Jesus is. They deny the Jesus that hates sin. We could go on and on, but we get the picture, I hope. We don't have to have perfect theology, though, to be born again. But being born again will prompt us to improve our theology. We will desire to know Christ more fully. Are you putting up with aberrant views of Christ just to get along? It happens. It's easy to do. Corinth put up with it. They put up with the proclamation of another Jesus. Don't fall into that trap. They put up with it. Scripture is clear about who Jesus is. The only Jesus who saves is the Jesus of the Bible. Let's remember that. Back to our text. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, let's stop right there. Another spirit, a different spirit. Corinth, you're putting up with a different spirit here. Look in your Bible. Look, that word spirit in your Bible, is it capitalized or is it not capitalized? It's not capitalized. Why? Because there is only one Holy Spirit, capital S Spirit. A different spirit cannot be the Holy Spirit. He is unique. He is a person, the third person of the triune God. He is the comforter promised by Christ. He is the helper, the paraclete. The one who comes alongside. He proceeds from the Father and from the Son. He bears witness to the Son. Corinth was putting up with a different spirit who did not do those things. They were allowing demonic, false prophets to come in preaching another Christ by the power of a different spirit. Amen. First Corinthians and in Ephesians, Paul writes of one spirit, bringing us into one body. The Holy Spirit brings us into the family of God by the preaching of the word. The one spirit is not chaotic. He is not the author of confusion. He is not contradictory. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspired the entirety of Holy Scripture. He will not contradict his own work. Remember that. Amen. People come to you telling you they got a fresh word from God. Ask them, does it line up with the word of God? They tell you that God gave them revelation in a dream? Tell them they better contact the Bible publishers because we're going to have to add a new book after revelation if that's the truth. No, they don't mean it that way, do they? But that's how we need to take it. We need to know the Holy Spirit inspired this because you had spaghetti before you went to bed last night and you had a crazy dream you want to give credit to God for that one spirit bringing us into one body non-chaotic he will not contradict he convicts of what sin of righteousness of judgment he is not a force many people will call him a force like from star wars he is a person a person with a distinct personality who has things that he specifically does. He is not part of God. That's a heresy called partialism. He is God. He never points to himself, though. That's another good way you can tell if somebody's getting a word from the Holy Spirit and they're always pointing to the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit never points to himself. He's always pointing to the Son, isn't he? He's pointing to the Father. Paul says... That this is a spirit that they did not receive. 
If you're born again, you received the Holy Spirit. Some of our more charismatic brothers and sisters, they might say that there's this second blessing or second reception of the Holy Spirit. No, when you are born again, you get the Holy Spirit. He comes in and indwells you forever. He indwells them in Corinth. Yet, what are they doing? They're putting up with a different spirit. These false teachers, they're putting up with them. Many abuses of the person of the Holy Spirit today are really a different spirit. Many in the charismatic movement, now not all, this is a not all thing, hear me say not all charismatics, but there are many in the charismatic movement that abuse the Holy Spirit that blaspheme his name. Bethel Church out in Redding, California. It's a hotbed of this kind of blasphemy. This is the church out of which the music group Jesus Culture comes. If y'all have ever heard of the band Jesus Culture, they're out of this heretical church. This group, they claim that by the Holy Spirit, glitter comes out of the air conditioning ducts. That this is the glory of God coming down. Glitter out of the air conditioning ducts. Well, if this were God's glory coming down out of the air conditioning ducts, then they would all be dead. Because if we or they or anyone were in the presence of a holy God in our sinful condition right now, we would immediately die. That sounds like a different spirit to me. How about y'all? They claim to be able to suck blessings from the graves of dead saints. That sounds like a different spirit to me. How about y'all? One of their leading prophetesses said she took a trip to heaven where she saw the Holy Spirit and that he was kind of blue. That sounds like a little bit different spirit to me, right? It sounds like she was experiencing the spirit of the genie from Aladdin. That is not the Holy Spirit. Many true Christians put up with this blasphemy. Why? Oh, because I like their music. Why? Because I can worship to their music. Well, I guess you can worship to their music. Can't you? Because if your preferences override the clear teaching of the word of God, it isn't God whom you're worshiping. It is yourself. Corinth, don't put up with a different spirit. That's to the path to death. Bass Chapel, don't put up with a different spirit. You're walking a tightrope over a shark tank. It's not going to turn out well. Know the real thing. Know the real Holy Spirit. Know the works of the real Holy Spirit. You won't be duped by a counterfeit. Amen. Bethel's an extreme case, but what about everyday living? We, we attribute ideas we think this is a really good idea. It's like, well, the Holy Spirit gave me this. What if everybody else in here thinks that's a really terrible idea? And they're all Christians too. So what I'm attributing to the Holy Spirit, they're thinking is terrible and they have the Holy Spirit. It's really just me trying to pretend to be pious, saying, well, I don't want to take credit for this because I think it's a really good idea. I'm going to give that, I'm going to give the credit to God. Well, Hold your horses on that. Maybe just give glory to God if it turns out to be great. How about somebody asks you to serve in some way? And you say, well, to buy a little time, so let me go pray about it. I got to go pray about this. And then you come back and you, we, we want to use the Holy Spirit as an excuse. Well, I don't really want to do it, but I don't want to tell them I don't want to do it. So let's, let's wait a couple of days. Let's, let's pray about it. And then I come back and say, hey, I don't feel led by the Holy Spirit to do that, y'all. I really don't feel led. So what is that? Did the Holy Spirit do that or is that just our excuse? Well, if it's not a command, a direct command from Scripture, it's okay to say I don't want to do that. It's fine and dandy to say that. But don't let's not drag the Holy Spirit in saying he led me to say no, I shouldn't do it. Now, in, in the bigger picture, he did lead us to say we didn't want to do it. We say, okay, I, I just don't think that's for me. I don't, I don't think I have the time. I don't think that that's a ministry I want to participate in. If it's not a clear command, it's okay to say no. 
But if it is a clear command, well, then we need to be obedient to the clear command from Scripture. But let's not go around blaming the Holy Spirit when we just don't want to do something. <clears throat> feelings, we also, we also will, will blame our feelings on the Holy Spirit. But guess what? Feelings will come and go. Feelings are up. Feelings are down. But the Word of God is unchanging. Don't trust your feelings. You say, I don't feel very Christian-y today. It doesn't matter what your feelings say. The Word of God says if you have repented of your sins and trusted in Christ, that you are a Christian sealed. Amen. Your feelings don't matter when it comes to what the Word of God says. If it says you're born again, then you are. Don't trust your feelings. Trust Scripture. Every head bowed, every eye closed, soft music playing, lights dimmed. Wow, did you feel the Spirit move? You've heard that. That's emotionalism. We've exchanged the Spirit of God for the spirit of emotionalism. Don't be duped by this, guys. Those are the ones who came in the front door with all the pomp and circumstance, and they slide right out the back door as a secret. Don't be deceived by a different spirit. There is only one spirit who is the Holy Spirit. Only one spirit who can indwell a believer. Only one spirit who makes dead things alive. Amen. Don't bear with a different spirit like Corinth did. Don't bear with it. So we've talked about another Jesus. We've talked about another spirit. How about another gospel? Let's look back at verse 4. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. A different gospel. Another gospel. There are many gospels floating around. Those other gospels usually have another Jesus. And they usually have another spirit. If you've got another Jesus, you definitely have another gospel. If you have a different spirit, you definitely have another gospel. But it doesn't stop there. You can have the right Jesus. You can have the right spirit. You can have those doctrines right, but still miss the gospel. You can have every I of the Trinity dotted. You can have every T of the hypostatic union crossed, but still have a different gospel. A different gospel is not good news at all. We know the gospel. It means good news. But if you've got another gospel, you've got nothing but bad news. To miss the truth of free grace from a merciful God means eternal damnation. Those groups we mentioned before when we were talking about another Jesus, they got the wrong Jesus. They've got the wrong spirit. So by default, they have the wrong gospel. We've talked in here about knowing the difference between law and gospel. Some will try to proclaim law as gospel. Luther, he said that you are a doctor of theology if you can rightly distinguish the law and the gospel. Remember, we've, we've had this, I think mostly on Wednesday nights when, when I've had the chance to teach, we've talked about the difference in law and gospel. Law says do. If you can do it, it ain't the gospel. The gospel says done. Jesus has done it. Law says do this and live. The gospel says live. Now go do this. Now go obey the law. Living comes first. What Jesus has done comes first. What is the gospel? Well, 1 Corinthians 15. You think these Corinthians would maybe know 1 Corinthians 15? They didn't know that there was a 1 in front of Corinthians back then. They didn't know that there was a 15th chapter because there weren't chapter divisions back then. But surely Paul's audience is familiar with the text, right? Right? He had written it to this very body of believers. 1 Corinthians 15 says, Now I make known to you, brethren, 
the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. For if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. <coughs> Excuse me. The death, burial, and resurrection. In strict terms, that's what we normally think about as the gospel. But more broadly, let's think about the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. First four books of the New Testament. What are they? It says they're the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, according to John. More broadly than just the death, burial, and resurrection, it's everything Jesus has done is the gospel. All that he did. <clears throat> Being born of a virgin is essential. His perfect, obedient life is essential. Of course, his death, his burial, his resurrection... The fact that he will return in all of his glory, those are essential. Is this the gospel that you believe? Is this the gospel that joined you to Christ, as we saw this morning, just a few verses up, <coughs> being joined to Christ? Is this the gospel that you cling to with all of your hope, with all of your being? Is this the gospel that you're clinging to? This is the only gospel that saves. This is the only gospel of Jesus Christ. Any different gospel? It's not good news. It's just bad news. Any other gospel? Damns. Any other gospel means eternal death. Eternal conscious torment. And I mentioned Spurgeon's quote a couple of times. I'm going to say it again. Difference in truth and almost truth. The difference in Grandma's brownies and a spoonful of manure in there. Almost truth. If someone tells you you get to heaven by eating a chicken sandwich from Chick-fil-A every day, we can tell that's a false gospel, can't we? You're going to have to keep one in the fridge on Saturday so you can eat it on Sunday, right? We know that's a false gospel. That's got nothing to do with what Christ did. It's easy to see that when it's so blatant. I see smiles and giggles out there. But what about when something's not so obvious? Many people will proclaim that you have to speak in tongues. Sorry, everybody who actually reads scripture in context, you can't go to heaven because you didn't speak in tongues. Church of Christ says you have to be baptized. Sorry, everybody who died before they had a chance to be baptized. King James only will say you have to read the King James Version of the Bible. Sorry, everybody, in the first 1,600 years of the church, you're all going to hell. Many will say obedience is on par with faith for justification. I guess that puts every one of us out of the kingdom, don't it? Remember the law, gospel, distinctive. Don't conflate the two. Don't conflate justification and sanctification. Don't conflate the works of Christ with the works of self. Don't conflate Christ for you, justification, and Christ in you, sanctification. Christ in your place, Christ for you. Christ working through you to sanctify you, sanctification. Remember the difference. Christ for you versus Christ in you. Critical theory, social justice, wokeness, if you've heard of those things, it has infiltrated many otherwise sound churches, sound organizations, sound seminaries. The woke world <coughs> says Jesus isn't enough. Let's browbeat you into submission because you're a part of the oppressor class, right? People who look like you have been in power, and those people sinned, so you've got to repent for their sins. I know you weren't alive when that happened, but you look like those people, so you've got to repent. You must give up your opinions is what they say. You don't get to speak on that. If you don't have a uterus, you don't get to talk about abortion. That's what they'll tell you. You must repent 
for sins you didn't commit is what they're going to tell you. Then Jesus is enough, right? You're sexist simply by being a man. You're racist if you say you aren't racist. They say they believe Christ is enough. They say they believe the Bible is inerrant, but that but always comes, and that but always means that Jesus ain't enough. That but always comes in the liberal drift. You've got to agree with me to be saved, is what they say. That is their gospel, and that's a diff different gospel. And when you got a different gospel, you got no gospel at all. Liberal Christianity, which really isn't Christianity, we said that earlier, says Christ to be crucified, that that was cosmic child abuse. They say the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, Christ for you, Christ on the cross in my place, they say that that is a doctrine of an evil God. They say that Christ didn't die as a substitute, but that he rather died as an example. What kind of an example is that? Here, let's all get crucified, right? No, he died in our place. He died as a substitute. No, Christians, Christ had to die according to the predetermined plan as a substitute, as that Passover lamb, the lamb who would take away the sins of the world. He died as a substitute or else we are still lost in our sins. If he didn't die as a substitute, you and I are going to hell. We've got no hope. But guess what? Scripture trumps liberal philosophy. Scripture trumps hurt feelings. Scripture says he died in my place. Praise God. Even if you have the right Jesus, even if you have the right spirit doctrinally, that doesn't mean you have the right gospel. Rome we would be able to check off the boxes that Rome has sound doctrine when it comes to Jesus and who he is. We would be able to check off that Rome has sound doctrine as to who the Holy Spirit is. Their pneumatology. Pneumatology is the study of the Holy Spirit. We, we would be able to check both of those off. But guess what? Not regarding their power. They neuter the power of the gospel. They will say it's Jesus plus the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, communion. They will say it's Jesus plus baptism. They will say it's Jesus plus, plus last rites. Jesus plus getting married in the church. Jesus plus time in purgatory. Jesus plus Mary. Jesus plus the Pope. You get the gist? Jesus plus anything neuters the gospel of its power. It's Christ alone. The gospel is Jesus Christ and Him alone. Don't tolerate a different gospel. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, as revealed in Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Take one of those alones out, you got no gospel. Take any of them out. You have no gospel. Paul answers the question of how much heresy is too much heresy. Probably if you just turn over one page in your Bible from 2 Corinthians over to Galatians chapter 1. <coughs> Verses 8 and 9. I'm reading this out of the New American Standard. It says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you. He is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. That word accursed is ananthema. It means to be damned. Preaching one tiny thing. What were they preaching in Galatia? You had to be circumcised. They added one thing to Jesus. They added circumcision to Jesus. 
If any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, let him be accursed. How much heresy is too much heresy? Asked Paul. How much heresy is too much heresy? A different Jesus? Heresy. A different spirit? Heresy. A different gospel? Heresy. How much heresy is too much? Trust in the true gospel, the true spirit, the true Jesus, the one revealed in Scripture. The true gospel is the power of God to salvation. What gospel do you love? What gospel do your loved ones love? What gospel do your loved ones believe? Do they believe everyone except Hitler and Stalin automatically go to heaven? That's a pretty common belief around here. Oh, everybody but Hitler. Everybody's a pretty good person. They're going to get there, right? Well, Stalin did kill more than Hitler, so, well, we'll send him to hell too, right? That's, that's what the bulk of people believe, and they really believe it because they think they are good people, and they think heaven is a reward for good people. It's not. If heaven were a reward for good people, there'd be a population of one, God. No. Oh. It is for God's glory alone that he rescues wicked sinners like us. Everybody doesn't automatically get to go to heaven. Do they believe all roads lead to God? All roads do lead to God, but all roads don't lead to heaven. Every road will lead to God. Everyone will stand before God on judgment day. If they're hidden in Christ... Enter into my reward. If you're trusting in being a good Buddhist, depart from me. I never knew you. Trusting in being a good Jehovah's Witness, depart from me. I never knew you. Trusting in being even a good Baptist, depart from me. I never knew you. Trusting in Christ alone, enter in. Do they believe the true gospel? Do your family members, do your friends, do they believe the true gospel? But maybe they just believe it intellectually. Maybe they're not trusting in it. Many, 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 many people believe the facts of the gospel in their mind. But they're not trusting in it. They're not trusting and clinging to Christ with every ounce of their being. There's a great chasm between an intellectual knowledge and a trusting knowledge. Are they trusting in the false gospel of the walked aisle and the repeated prayer? If you have to walk an aisle, the invalid can never go to heaven. If you have to repeat a prayer, the mute would never be able to get to heaven. But our gospel is much greater than that. Our gospel is much simpler than that. Our God is greater. He made it a free gift of His sovereign grace. Praise Him for it. Don't proclaim. Don't tolerate a different Christ. Don't tolerate a different spirit. Don't tolerate a different gospel. Trust in the true gospel with the true spirit and the true Christ all revealed in Scripture alone to the glory of God alone. Let's pray. Father, you are so good. You are so good that before time began, you, you decided that your Son would come redeem a people that you chose. That he would accomplish it on that cross. And that your Holy Spirit would come and apply that salvation to the lives of undeserving wretches. May we praise you all the more for it. May we proclaim that truth to the lost world out there. Let us not compromise. Let us not fear man. But let us fear you that we would proclaim your truth. Help us to dwell on your truth. Help us to love you all the more because of the glorious gospel the simplicity of it. And may we not tolerate false teaching. Help us through our day and help us through our week. In the name of Jesus, your Son, amen.